Um, I'm a clinical psychologist with uh, a, a developmental psychology background, and um, I got interested uh, in the study of um, misinformation or making sense of nonsense uh, shortly after the 2016 uh, election where I was just kind of mixed emotions, I was kind of depressed, I was mad, I was all kinds of stuff. And then in my private practice and working with children, um, I was having children who were coming in, you know, emergency meetings to come in, appointments, because, um, you know, I was thinking about this nine-year-old this morning that I had worked with who came in because um, right after the, the, the day of the election, um, he thought that the next day he and his uh, his parents and the rest of his family were going to go to jail. <laughs> that was a nine-year-old's interpretation of what happened after um, after the election. So um, I ended up um, beginning to uh, look into the research on where it all begins um, in childhood and um, how do people develop these belief systems, you know, when does it all begin? Um, and that's what I'm going to be addressing quite a bit uh, this morning, just on the development and formation of nonsensical thinking that starts early in life, like about the age of uh, four. Um, and before I, uh, we delve into that, um, I'm going to uh, turn to my colleague, uh, my husband, Mark Whitmore, and, um, and have uh, Mark as well as Emily talk a bit about how they became interested in this whole topic of misinformation. Well, um, <clears throat> my, I'm an industrial organizational psychologist, so actually my area is focus has really been on leadership development, and that's where most of my uh, efforts are in that area. But um, so I actually approach this from a very personal standpoint, just watching late night uh, television, Stephen Colbert and people like that, and laughing along with lots of millions of other Americans about all these crazy things that were happening, and then just feeling that, uh, just laughing about it's not enough, is there something that uh, we could do? And I was just trying to think, well, what, what can I do? I'm not a multimillionaire, I can't hire ads to sort of try to counteract maybe whatever false information is being presented. And so uh, I thought, well, what do professors do? We write papers. So we wrote, I wrote a paper, my wife wrote a paper, we presented it at the American Psychological uh, National Conference in August. Um, and an interesting story, the paper, the uh, APA did a press release of our paper uh, and it just happened that the week that the press release went out, earlier in the week, um, President Trump had accused all the major news outlets of um, uh, uh, spreading fake news, and then the editors had come together and written or a, a rebuttal to that. That was like two, day, two days before the APA released our, the press release of our paper, and the, the uh, conference, the uh, symposium was called Making Sense of Nonsense. Um, it's funny, too, because when we presented it, there were maybe 20 people in the room, and I thought, well, you know, that's not too bad, you know. And uh, we went on a nice holiday afterwards, and then when we came back, uh, we started seeing, we didn't look at any of our media, we were in, enjoying the California coastline. When we came back, uh, we started seeing all these these um, uh, emails from friends saying, oh, we saw you in the news, we saw you in the news. And the paper went, the press release went viral, and uh, within a week, 27 news outlets around the world had published a, uh, excerpts from our articles in their news uh, releases, and. Um, Kent State does a monitor of how many hits there are, media hits, and there were, within a week, 38 million, a little over 38 million people had seen the paper. So it's just a, wow, <laughs> it went viral. So that was kind of uh, interesting to see that. It's interesting to see across 27 news outlets how they all interpreted what we said slightly differently. 
Um, but so that was really my, um, how I got into it. Now I'm actually doing some research because we're, uh, my area is also information sciences, so we're doing a lot of uh, research now looking at artificial intelligence systems and how these algorithms may actually be encouraging and fostering the spread of false information. Now I really want to know what this paper says. 38 million people can't be wrong. Uh, so I will we'll look forward to that. Uh, so I got into the, uh, the misinformation game uh, way back in what, 2009 or so when I was starting to decide on a dissertation topic and my advisor said, you know, there's this crazy rumor about Barack Obama that he wasn't really born in the United States. What if he did something about that? And I thought, oh, all right, I guess, you know, it's kind of a niche topic, you know, misinformation. Uh, it's not really, it doesn't really have wide appeal or wide interest, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my dissertation on that. It turns out that was a really good investment on, uh, on my part. So, uh, yeah, that's how I got into the misinform in misinformation game. Um, since then, I've been working on kind of how misinformation continues to affect attitudes even after it's corrected. Um, my more recent research is on misperceptions about public policy rather than about partisan politics, so what people get wrong about how government actually works and the extent to which uh, these misperceptions that often come from kind of biased cognitive processes rather than explicit misinformation, the extent to which they can be corrected. And spoiler alert, they can be corrected actually uh, pretty easily. I also, like some of the previous panelists, have a more optimistic view about people um, and the effects of fake news and misinformation than I think uh, a lot of folks do. So I'm hoping to share some of those thoughts with you over the course of this panel. Great, uh, thank you. Um, and so starting out, I guess, uh, in terms of what is fake news, um, and it was defined at uh, the previous, um, um, at from 8.30 to 10, the group talked about fake news. Um, and. Uh, I, so, just a general definition, um, where an entire media outlet uh, sets, up, sets up to propagate um, intentionally misleading um, and falsified information. Um, anybody want to add to that here uh, about what the definition of fake news is? Or? Uh, I mean, I, I would say that to some extent it, it matters in some contexts, less what we think fake news is and more what people think fake news is. And that is a really important question, is what does the public think fake news is? Um, and it turns out that Republicans and Democrats have really different views of what fake news is. So Republicans are more likely to say that it something counts as fake news even if it's just biased, right? So it's reporting that favors one side or the other, that's fake news. Um, versus Democrats are a little bit more likely to say that, oh, it's just something that is intentionally false, right? And so I, I do think that it's important to be aware of the distinction. Even, even if we spend a lot of time creating these typologies, those might not be the typologies that resonate with the public. Um, and so when we think about the effects of fake news, it's also important to think about the effect, effects of those terms and how different people understand that concept. Well, it's funny, I because uh, we were asked in advance, can you come up with a definition of fake news? And so uh, we actually have a definition we're using on this research team I'm on. And actually, the definition is from an article that Emily is a co-author on. So, But uh, basically, what it says is that it's fabricated information that mimics news media content and form, but not in organizational process or intent. Um, but I would also agree, I, one of the things I was thinking of uh, listening to this morning's panel, and it's always great to come, go second, you know, because, uh, but uh, intentionality seems to be a major issue in terms of what is fake information versus what is false information, because you could also have people spreading false information, but they actually believe it to be true, and uh, so therefore, they're not intentionally trying to deceive, even though the information itself may be deceptive. So uh, it's a very um, uh, fuzzy kind of boundary, I think, at this point. But I also think that since uh, this is early on in terms of the investigation of this area, maybe it's a good idea not to have too restrictive a definition and to allow a little bit more broad uh, 
space, if you will, in order to do the research, and at some point somebody will come up with some brilliant definition that will capture everything. Um, okay, well, <clears throat> that leads into talking more about what psychological processes uh, make people more susceptible to the effects of misinformation. And um, I'd like to talk uh, briefly about um, childhood and basically the development and formation of nonsensical thinking um, really begins in the early years of life when um, parents are continuing to mold and shape their uh, children's uh, thinking and eventual belief systems. Um, so by, we you know, what the research shows is by about the age of four, when children now have what's called represent, represent, representational thought, um, that where they can consistently judge the difference between fantasy and reality. Um, and it's about this time that um, they can distinguish lies from truths. Um, and then by about the age of seven, a child has the ability now, developmentally, to rationalize their thinking um, and to begin to use belief, um, which um, you know really starts out, um, when I was talking about the four years of age, um, in pretend play. So you know, parents <clears throat> are encouraging their children to try out different roles in the culture and uh, to continue to pretend. And uh, again, by about the age of seven, uh, children begin to have these uh, belief systems, primitive belief systems or rudimentary belief systems. Um, and um, you know, parents are highly motivated to encourage their children um, to be involved in make-believe because illusory thinking is kind of the foundation to um, to uh, the development of self. Um, and <clears throat> interestingly, um, uh, there was a study done um, more recently uh, with four and six-year-olds just to kind of demonstrate to uh, the audience here a little bit more about um, what I mean by this uh, fantasy reality distinction. Um, so in this study, uh, there were uh, four and six-year-olds, and the researchers had two boxes that they placed in front of these children, and they told them that imagine in one box was a puppy dog, and in the other box was a monster. And then they told the children they could approach the boxes if they'd like, so they observed the children, and as they approached, the children, all of them, went to the box of the puppy dog and stuck their fingers in the box, but in the second box, where presumably there was a monster, nobody went, none of the children went near the uh, box. Um, so then they had an, another, a second condition where the uh, researchers showed those boxes to the children and showed them that there was nothing in the boxes. Um, but then they said, well, now, you know, imagine again that in this box, box A is a puppy dog and in the second box is a monster. And uh, they observed the children again, and all the children went directly to the box of the puppy dog and stuck their fingers in the box. Um, but again, none went to the monster box. So um, our, you know, my kind of take on this is that, <clears throat> that uh, you know, these children are already uh, developing a sense maybe of confirmatory bias, where they've already been taught or they've already learned this uh, concept of what to be afraid of, that monsters are, are fearful, uh, or to, be a fe to fear monsters. And uh, so even by the age of four to six years of age, this is already being established. Um, and, uh, and again, this goes back into this confirmatory bias, which, uh, you know, carries through into adulthood. Um, and adults use confirmatory bias quite a bit. Um, in uh, making sense um, of, uh, of nonsense. Um, any uh, comments in, you have about? Well, uh, maybe just the interesting thing I think about that study is uh, these children were, uh, uh, even in the face of reality, the reality was there was nothing in the box. They still refused to go to the box that had a monster in it. 
So you could say, oh, okay, but these are children, right? Adults would not do that. Well, we actually found another study that was done, uh, totally separate. It's interesting, the research is very fragmented, and you don't see a lot of people citing each other's research. But this was a study done with adults, and in this particular study, they had uh, bottles of water, and they asked the uh, subjects to fill the bottles from a common source, tap water, and then these are adults. In one bottle, they had labeled it strychnine. The other bottle, they labeled it water. And then they asked the uh, subjects to either drink from the bottle of water or dr drink from the bottle labeled strychnine, and they all drank from the bottle of water. Nobody would drink from the bottle labeled strychnine, even though they filled the bottles themselves with water. So they knew that both bottles were filled with the same substance. They still refused to drink the bottle of strychnine. And then I think this kind of interesting, uh, they did another condition where they labeled the bottles uh, water and not strychnine. And they still refuse to drink out of the bottle that was labeled not strychnine. So, again, you know, another uh, very strongly held belief that poison is bad for you, and even if you see a label, and you know that, you know, in this case, the denial of reality for the sake of these preconceived ideas that people have. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? So, when you guys say refuse to, the kids refuse to touch the monster box, and the people refuse to drink from the bottle, I, to me, there's a difference between which one of these, which one of these boxes do you want to touch, and then they choose, or which one of these bottles mm -hmm. of water do you want to touch, and then they choose, versus the researcher saying, "Now I want you to go over and put your fingers in the monster box," or "Now I want you to drink from this water that has a strychnine in it." And I think that has resonance for what we think of as seeking out corrections or believing confirmatory information. So, mm -hmm. is it that people just opted to do whatever conformed to their kind of imaginary beliefs, or that they actively refused to? Uh, do something that seemed wrong in this imaginary context? Well, I, I think in the one with the puppy dog and the monster, they were uh, left to their own devices, okay. those children, and they had, they nobody was putting pressure on them to do anything. They just kind of left them and observed them, and they approached the box with the puppy dog, and but with with the idea that, you know, the understanding is after the fact these children already had this notion mm -hmm. that monsters should be feared. Um, and puppy dogs would be nice and soft and nurturing. But And the other one, too? And I had to look at the article to see how they set up the condition. I think the first condition, though, they just had people choose what bottle they wanted to drink from. But I'm pretty sure in the second condition, um, there was some... Uh, prompt on the part of the researchers to about drinking from the other bottle. I know to me it was kind of interesting because I read that whole Lewandowski article on debiasing and the whole issue about retraction and uh, belief in uh, you know the fact that sometimes retractions have this backfire effect and so on. And I was kind of thinking, well, in a way it was sort of like a backfire effect, you know, by saying not strychnine. It didn't work, you know. They still wouldn't drink from the bottle, even though there was this declaration that it wasn't uh, poison. But for us, I think the whole, what it's saying is how strongly held beliefs are and the, how early in life these beliefs are held so that, you know, later in life you might get into issues of wanting to do things like literacy training and uh, media literacy and things like that, but already you're not in a situation where you're training people who are blank slate. You're training people who already have very firmly held beliefs. So it's almost a matter of trying to untrain people and their thought processes before you could retrain them, which might be an issue why the, issue, the concern about does all this literacy training really work or not um, is still an open-ended question. Um, well, um, to continue uh, talking about uh, a little bit more about parental belief systems and how they influence children's uh, beliefs and fantasies, um, I uh, was looking more closely at the literature on um, the most common 
make-believe uh, popular cultural belief uh, in the culture, which is, of course, Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, the uh, Tooth Fairy, um, and, um, you know, uh, parents uh, are obviously shaping their children to believe in something that uh, uh, isn't true. Um, but, uh, again, this is pretending, encouraging the child um, to be part of this illusory kind of deceptive uh, system. And, I mean, it's important. It's not necessarily a negative. Um, as I was saying, children in part of their development need to uh, experience, uh, uh, you know, illusion um, in order to, uh, as they become adults, to become more sophisticated in, in their thinking. Um, but what was interesting in the research I was looking at, that by about the age of seven, children actually know that Santa Claus isn't real, but they play along with it um, because um, they reap the benefits. I mean, um, you know, if, if they get their presents or, you know, um, as well as, you know, get money from the Tooth Fairy. Um, and um, then looking a little bit more uh, at uh, parents' own beliefs, um, you know, obviously some parents continue to believe in these fictional characters. Um, and uh, even through adolescence, I mean, by adolescence, you know, you see uh, these uh, teenagers are still uh, following along with their parents' uh, fantasies, uh, you know, and uh, believing in Santa Claus and, you know, going down and seeing them half-eaten cookies and the milk drunk by the Santa Claus. Um, but uh, what was interesting, too, is um, that just the power of the parent, uh, their belief systems, um, so even uh, with religious beliefs. So uh, some of the research I was looking at found that uh, parents who are highly uh, religious, uh, uh, their children who identify with the parents in their faith as well as just identifying the parent, uh, they, uh, uh, you know, I um, agree with the parent uh, in their belief systems uh, are more likely um, to um, uh, to follow through uh, with uh, parents who believe in who have these strong religious beliefs. Um, also, uh, it's negatively correlated with uh, any kind of scientific belief. So if children are being raised in an environment where there's more of this, uh, you know, uh, un not founded or unfounded uh, belief system, uh, children are growing up also to, um, to follow these parents who tend to also have magical beliefs, uh, believing in UFOs and uh, ghosts and magic and so forth. Um, and uh, so I thought that was an interesting finding too. Uh, as well as um, in terms of uh, news, interest in news, it's been found too that like adolescents, young adolescents, tend to uh, uh, believe or, or watch the same news, the traditional news that their parents watch. It isn't until later adolescents when uh, they begin sometimes to become more omnivores. They call, in one study they call them uh, news omnivores where they're more interested in a variety of news outlets, um, so um, and that comes with more individuation and in, in thinking. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mark or Emily if you have uh, some uh, input here. Um, yeah, so I have some. I, I guess I to follow up again on sort of these studies and yeah. what they mean for our understanding of how people interact with the information environment and with uh, potentially fake news or misinformation in particular. So you know, I have a two and a half year old daughter and if she went over to a box that I said there's a monster in there and stuck her fingers in there, I would be very concerned, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I, it seems like a good thing that they mm -hmm. are, they're able to do this. But if I said to her, hey, listen, Sabine, you know, there's not a monster in there and there's a cookie in there for you. And then she still wouldn't go over, then I would be really concerned, right? Because then she's not updating her beliefs based on the new information that a trusted source, me, is giving her. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, is what we're concerned about. Not that people hold, it, it, I'm glad that people aren't drinking from water labeled strychnine, but if they continue to not drink from that bottle, even after they're either incentivized or 
they're given new information which should change their beliefs, that starts to concern me, I guess. And this is, and when it comes to, put this in the back in the context of childhood, I'm really interested in how that ability develops, the ability to kind of update your beliefs and to be searching for new information to update your beliefs. And this came up earlier when we were talking about, when the previous panel was talking about, um, I think Kelly was mentioning when, how can we educate people to be more interested in seeking out the correct information? How can we heighten people's accuracy motivation to put it in, the, in a motivated reasoning sense? Um, and, you know, I, I think, I think of this in the need for cognition sense, right? That some people are just higher in need for cognition than other people. They need more information, they want more information. But my sense is that that develops really early on. It's almost a personality trait. And so are there interventions that we can do early on to heighten that and to heighten people's receptivity to new information that might change their pre-existing beliefs? So I would be fascinated to hear you guys' take on that. Um, well, um, I think that um, early on, if um, you know, parents, um, you know, were more involved in uh, shaping their children's beliefs to be a little bit more skeptical um, about uh, information um, that they're being exposed to, um, you know, helping their children to be more critical thinkers uh, about the variety of uh, information out there that children are exposed to from their peers or other authority figures. Um, I think that that's an effective means, um, although the, the difficult part is the parents who, you know, have belief systems that are, you know, more based on uh, nonsensical thinking. <laughs> it's hard to change that cognitive piece. I don't know, I'm not a child psychologist, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah. Um, well, you know, another, uh, I think, challenge uh, in childhood is um, that, uh, you know, when children become more aware as they develop uh, that there are these inconsistencies between fantasy and reality, um, that uh, the, the tendency is to become more anxious. And so, uh, you know, what human beings learn is uh, to develop some defensive modes or defense mechanisms to manage uh, their anxiety. So, uh, over time, what happens is, uh, you know, children begin to, um, by about the age of seven, um, to start, uh, you know, helping them, helping to manage anxious feelings because of the uh, differences in uh, messages that they're receiving from, uh, you know, what's fantasy and what's reality, monsters, you know, things that they're exposed to. <clears throat> so um, children at that age begin to use some self-deception. And um, I think that goes along with, Emily, what you're bringing up, you know, what do you, so authority figures can help children uh, at a young age to be skeptical and to be more critical in their thinking, but I also, it's the development of defense modes or defense mechanisms that children are beginning to use uh, as a viable means to manage uh, conflicting information that they're getting. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think uh, when you look at the literature, too, a couple of concerns about it from a parenting standpoint is the extent to which the parents are using these belief systems to get children to conform. Um, and secondly, you know, for a lot of children, the parent is the authority. So then you have also a situation where they're learning to conform to an authority that's telling them to do things or to believe things that they know are false. And uh, to, you know, so if you if you engage a lot in that type of behavior, I think the concern would be that as adults, uh, they've learned that pattern. They've learned that people in authority, you know, may tell us to do things that uh, we know are false, but uh, we've also learned we need to conform to that. In fact, uh, if you look at what uh, parents a lot of times do around these sort of illusionary beliefs is they reward children for the beliefs and they punish children if they don't believe in it or they don't follow through. They may not personally believe in it, but if they don't behave in a way that the parent wants them to, then they get punished around it too. So uh, 
you've sort of set up this whole pattern of behavior and belief uh, around confirmation of things that actually are unrealistic. Um, and so then the issue is, how does this carry out in adulthood? And so I've kind of thought, well, maybe adolescence takes care of all this, because you know, teenagers reject everything. You know? They reject everything their parents say. But interestingly, when you actually look at the research on adolescents, early on, adolescents do they go through this sort of generalized rejection of everything my parents said, but actually when they do these longitudinal studies and they follow these uh, people into adulthood at some time in early adulthood, in many, many cases they actually switch back to these original beliefs that the parents had. And the view is that what happens is that when you reject all these illusionary beliefs, which have sort of protected you, you know, it's helped you try to make sense of the world and not feel anxious. But when you reject all of that, then you're confronted with all these anxieties. And eventually what happens is that the children, as adults, then go back and accept a lot of what their parents have been telling them. So I think our point, our interest really, and by the way, our paper is on making sense of nonsense. It really wasn't so much specific to fake news because it could be just false information too, not necessarily fake information. But our concern was that there's probably a carryover from childhood into adulthood. And um, that uh, these early childhood behaviors set up these patterns that, are, that have been reinforced and then these patterns determine adult adult behavior. Uh, I too am not a child development specialist, oh, so I'll have to take you for your word at, uh, at most of this. <laughs> um, and um, so then, um, uh, by adolescence, uh, back to talking about adolescence, as Mark was uh, addressing a bit, um, you know, this is a time when, um, uh, you know, they can look at alternative thoughts. Uh, you know, different from their parents, um, and uh, but yet, uh, you know, what's interesting is um, that that illusory belief system that adolescents now are well entrenched with, you know, becomes quite a bit of self-deception. So, um, and then you begin to look at the exposure of adolescents, you know, to uh, Facebook and Instagram and. Um, you know, other sources of uh, uh, media outlets and, um, you know, uh, younger adolescents, like I was saying earlier, seem to uh, manifest the same interest that their parents have in terms of what they uh, watch uh, in terms of the news. Um, but then as the older adolescents begin to uh, diversify and kind of begin to think about uh, you know, take in other kinds of news sources, which is interesting. Politically, uh, it's been shown that these adolescents who are more omnivores later in adolescence and look at a variety of news sources tend to be the ones that are more politically active or interested in politics. But the fear is that, you know, uh, overall, uh, most adolescents seem sort of uh, not interested in news at all. Um, and then the concern is, well, how's that going to affect the future generations in terms of, um, you know, be, uh, helping to make sense of, uh, you know, uh, what's uh, what's what news is uh, relevant to uh, uh, issues that are affecting these individuals uh, day to day? Um, any, Mark, do you have any input about, you know, what you've seen in the research um, about the uh, you know, how it's affected adults. Um, actually, I was just thinking of a, uh, I had a conversation yesterday with the uh, chief human resource officer at a major uh, insurance company, and he was expressing his frustration to me because they have all these sophisticated selection systems that are generating all these facts and information about candidates for jobs, and then when he would sit down with the hiring manager and present all the facts that would suggest that this person would not be a good candidate for the position, 
he said invariably the hiring managers pick that person anyway. And even though when they're faced with all these facts, because they have this gut feeling, this intuitive feeling that this person's going to work out, and said it's very frustrating because in many cases this, this happens over and over again, even though generally speaking what happens is this person leaves in the first or second year after an employment. So I don't know, to me it was, uh, it, it's another example of rejecting fact and reality over some sort of intuitive fictional uh, concept. So um, definitely these effects carry on into adulthood and they affect the way in which people interact with uh, others. Uh, we, in our, first of all I had to say there's a lot in the research on uh, fake news, there's all this finger pointing towards confirmatory bias and we need to get rid of confirmatory bias or and that's just never going to happen because confirmatory bias is just part of our makeup. It's how, in part, we make sense of the world and it's an adaptive behavior in most cases. It's actually very helpful. Uh, you know, we don't have to think a lot about a situation. We don't have to process all the facts and figures. We can just immediately get to a decision and if you're being chased by some uh, animal with big fangs and claws, you know, a, your confirmatory bias this is dangerous and I got to run away from that and that's been a very important adaptive behavior for human beings but um, to me the source though is not confirmatory bias in terms of acceptance uh, fake news the, the source is really uncertain I mean what triggers confirmatory bias is uncertain so the extent to which people are confronted with things that are um, strange or different, this then creates a sense of uncertainty or anxiety, and they have to somehow resolve this. And they could resolve it through accuracy, you know, by doing all this searching and trying to understand all the issues involved with it, or they could resolve it by just relying on their pre-existing beliefs. And so, and then the issue becomes, well, which route do you, do you choose? Which path do you take? And uh, one of the things we found with that is that in many cases people are manipulated uh, to choose one path or another. There's a body of literature on sensory priming, which is where uh, people will try to influence people's decision making or thought processes by introducing other elements. Um, and in fact, there was uh, some interesting studies done on um, in the uh, field of public uh, relations and also in, uh, political science where uh, priming effects, such as priming around party identification or priming based on accuracy. And the one I liked, I read that I liked most it had to do with the Affordable Care Act. I think it just came out, uh, maybe published this year where they found that if they prime people based on party identification, they, um, they would simply accept uh, whatever the party's viewpoint was towards the Affordable Care Act. That was true for Democrat and Republican. Or you could prime people based on accuracy uh, or performance, the performance of the plan and what they found, particularly if the individual had a health issue, then they would actually look to see is the plan working or not working, and how is it benefiting me? And uh, it's funny, after I read that article, I, you'll think all I do is listen to late night comedians, but I remember there was this, uh, I don't remember if it was Jimmy Kimmel or Fallon, but one of them went out onto the street and interviewed people, and he asked people on the street, what do you think of Obamacare? And everybody hated Obamacare. And then he, after he'd asked him about Obamacare, so what do you think about the Affordable Care Act? Oh, well, that's really great. I love the Affordable Care Act. We really need that. And then he'd say, well, you know, they're actually both the same thing. I mean, I remember at the time laughing about it, but I really wasn't thinking about, in a way, you're probably priming that person when you say Obamacare, you're priming that this is a democratic thing, and then you're going to get people more in tune with their party identification accept, reject, uh, whereas Affordable Care Act doesn't sound like it's related to any particular political party. And in fact, it's what a, what a great title, you know, who wouldn't want affordable medical care? So um, 
So you also have these kinds of forces that are impacting how people sort of make sense of uh, the world around them. So it's not just a passive issue on the part of the individual, you also have other actors who are really engaged in trying to shape people's thoughts and viewpoints. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly the case, as we know, that identity plays an enormous role in how we process information, the extent to which we believe it, the extent to which we allow it to inform our preferences. And so when it comes to, I think, especially political fake news, one of the questions we should be asking ourselves is, how much is people's partisan identity in play, um, right? And I do think, I do worry that because most of us who study fake news and politics are ourselves really involved in politics, our political identities are extremely important to us, um, we care about politics, that we tend to project that on the population as well. We think that everybody cares about politics as much as we do, and that isn't the case. Um, there's a great, uh, the New York Times actually, the, the Upshot just published the results of a new study that they did replicating some DSS survey data from years ago where they asked people, um, which of these is most, which of these identities is most important to you? And they asked them about 10 different identities. They included region, age, nationality, race, gender, um, party identification, your status and your family. Um, so 10 different ones. They, people can name the top three that were important to them. So it happened to be that the week that that study came out, I was teaching group identity in my grad public opinion class. So they had just read a whole bunch of stuff about group identity. And I said, all right, have any of you guys seen this study yet in, uh, in the New York Times? Everybody said no. And I said, all right, good. I want you to guess what the top three that people said were. Every single one they guessed was wrong. They guessed party was in the top. They all did. You know, they said, of course, partisan identification. We live in this polarized time, right? Everybody is so concerned. Party plays a huge role in what information people read on Facebook, what information they process. Party was second to last in this group. The only one lower was social, uh, uh, social class, right? Um, partisanship is not an important part of most people's identity, yes. When you put them in an experimental context with partisan stimuli, they absolutely will rely on their partisan identity in terms of how they process this. But in reality, people aren't placed in these contexts very much because most people, kind of as Eve alluded to earlier, don't care about politics very much. It's just not an important part of their lives. Um, a few, uh, maybe, uh, maybe 10 years ago, no, more like five years ago, back when Facebook was actually publishing papers and releasing data, um, they looked at uh, they looked at kind of how much of people's news feed was hard news, and they found I think it was around seven or eight percent. Um, so that think about uh, think about that. Think about how little of what people see and most people see in their Facebook news feeds is actually news, um, and this is news about politics. Um, and I've actually do this experiment in a lot of my classes. I actually have them go through and code their Facebook feeds, and even for political science majors only about 7% of what's in their Facebook news feed is news. Most of what's in there is cat pictures and updates from friends and things like that. So in the real world, most people simply are not being exposed to much news, period. And are not, partisanship is not necessarily a salient factor in, um, in their minds as they're kind of interacting with the world around them. So I think those are two really important things to keep in mind. And this is true when it comes to fake news as well. And we're starting to get some really good data from the 2016 election. Um, I think, you know, Brian, you talked about the super sharers. So there's just a few people who are sharing these fake news. It's also that there's just a few people who are reading most of these fake news. And the people who are reading it tend to be the people with already extreme partisan beliefs. So kind of fake news sharing and fake news readership is concentrated among this really small percentage of the population who is already pretty politically extreme on both sides. And to some extent, what that means is maybe we shouldn't worry quite as much about it changing people's minds, because these are the people who have already made up their minds long ago. Um, some, uh, some good work by uh, Brendan Nyhan and Andy Guest, where they actually track how people move through the web. So this is an opt-in survey. This isn't you know, creepy Big Brother stuff. Um, they can actually track how many people visited fake news websites in the 2016 election. On average, um, about one in four Americans saw one fake news article in the 2016 election around then. That's not that much, right? One article. Is one article gonna change somebody's vote? Is one article gonna change your vote? 
that act, those are two different questions. And I, I actually want to harken back to a very old, um, a very old theory in communications, which is the third person effect, which is that most people think that information, violent video games, fake news, has a much bigger effect on everybody else than it does on them. If I asked you guys, does one fake news article gonna change how you vote? You'd say, of course not, it's one article. Even if I believed it, it wouldn't probably change how I vote. Will that one fake news article or five fake news articles change how somebody else votes? Oh my God, yes, we better have a conference about it to talk about it, right? And uh, so there is, I think we're all really guilty of this third person effect when it comes to estimating the effect of fake news on other people. But there are also reasons to, I think to some extent kind of sad reasons, right? The, I'm saying one of the reasons we shouldn't be quite so concerned about fake news is because nobody cares about news at all, right? So that, that, that's not, it's sort of a depressing reason to not care about fake news, but it is real based on the kind of empirical data that we have. And maybe just to follow on a little bit of uh, what Emily's talking about, uh, I mean, I'm a professor in the business school, so, uh, and it was interesting when we looked at the uh, number of news outlets that picked up our article on making sense of nonsense, many of them were business news outlets. And so there is a broader issue with fake news that goes beyond just politics. And one of the uh, areas that is a particular concern is that our investors because the stock market is heavily, it can be heavily influenced by information that gets out on the news about companies. In fact, you know, recently there was an issue with Elon Musk, who is the CEO of Tesla, and he was musing about being burnt out, and, and he did it on his Twitter feed, and the stock dropped significantly because of that. So, uh, and uh, when you looked at the news outlets, and again, ours was more of not so much fake news, but how you make sense of contradictory information coming out. Uh, you know, we had uh, Market Watch, we had Morningstar, we had Marketplace, we had Business Journal, we had Crane's uh, Business Journal. They're all picking this up, and they're not really picking it up for politics. They're picking it up because uh, the news impacts investors' decisions about the value of companies. And that's, that's the real concern. So there is really a broader area than just uh, politics. Um, it's just kind of fun with politics because it's so visible, you know. Mm -hmm. And we have some major players right now who are engaged in that. But uh, it is definitely, you know, a broader issue. The other thing that we looked at um, is uh, how, what strategies do people use when they're confronted with uh, contradictory information, and um, uh, there's a whole body of literature on what are called uh, defense mechanisms or defense strategies, which when people are faced with contradictory and threatening information, um, they, they all engage in certain types of strategies to try to um, make sense of things, and one of these is denial. Uh, it's a very popular strategy. And uh, so, you know, it may be that the reason why people don't see fake news articles is because they've just decided they're not going to look at any news at all. The news is too threatening to them or too threatening to their beliefs, so they just deny. They're in a state of denial. They simply don't look at it. Um, but the issue, when you look at uh, these different strategies, some of these strategies are very dangerous in terms of mental health because uh, denial being one of them really uh, results in a, a distortion of reality. So just pretending that things don't exist because it makes you feel better is not a really good strategy to deal with the world, uh, especially long term, developing long term. And uh, But there are also a lot of other different strategies. There are strategies that are more, they're considered more adaptive, like being confronted with um, uh, contradictory information and then saying, oh, I want to do something about this. It's called sublimation. That's an adaptive strategy for people. So in the area of politics, it could be people saying, who haven't been involved in politics, saying, you know, I, they want to have an input. You know, they volunteer for uh, whatever party they believe in. Or people run for office or things like that. These are all 
uh, ways to sublimate that anxiety that they feel about you know current political situation. Um, so we also looked at these uh, different types of strategies, it's, and it's not an area yet that there's been um, any research. So I can't cite research showing how people use defensive strategies to deal with fake news. But we do know that they use defensive strategies to deal with other aspects of their lives. So we would assume that they would also be using it, uh, you know, if the source is information that they're getting uh, that's uh, threatening. Um, thank you. I um, like we've met our 45 minutes of uh, uh, discussion here, and I'd like to turn it now out to the audience here to um, find out what kinds of uh, comments or questions uh, people have. Yes. Even if there was, we would have no idea if that was socialization or something within the brain, right? Yes, exactly. I'm saying, but I, saying that's the male brain as opposed to something about how we socialize men versus how we socialize women, I think those are two very different claims with different implications. So you're 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 not arguing. You're saying is it something beyond socialization? Okay. I didn't. Yeah. We didn't. Uh, I mean, not that we uh, we probably looked at thirty or forty articles, but we didn't see anything in those that suggested anybody's looked at gender differences. Which is not. That, so, you know, it's not to say that gender differences might not have an impact. We just haven't seen any research done on that. Well, I would to respond uh, to your uh, question. Um, and uh, in adolescents, um, when they look at, say, defense mechanisms, um, you know, research has found some trends where, um, you know, uh, boys or young men uh, well, typically, uh, when they're anxious they'll, uh, or have some mixed emotions, they uh, will uh, lash out uh, at others. And women will tend to internalize their angst and, uh, you know, sometimes to a point where, you know, it becomes pathology where they might cut on themselves. So, th I mean, that, that I, I'm not sure if I'm addressing directly what you're asking, but I'm just saying there have been some trends in the way people manage, you know, some of those uh, uh, processes or, or, you know, their behavior. Um, uh, but uh, like Mark was uh, commenting, that um, there really isn't uh, a lot of uh, uh, work uh, on these gender differences in terms of, you know, how do people defend against uh, this information coming in or how does that, sh you know, how do they respond, are there sex differences between, uh, in, in this area? I think that's kind of early on. It needs to be... I mean, uh, it's interesting. Uh, we did a panel also at APA on uh, representation of women in high tech. And we had a group of um, women executives. I mean, it's a big issue for the nation. It's trying to get more women into high tech. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons why we don't have greater representation. But some of the issues uh, have to do with uh, the focus that uh, children have in terms of males being more focused towards like video gaming and things like that versus young girls. So and actually it's kind of interesting that now there's a, there's an organization called Girls That Code and things like that where they're trying to get more women 
uh, early on engaged in high tech with the idea that by the time you know they're ready to make career decisions, they'll they'll go into that area. So I could see where maybe you would find you know differences in frequencies uh, based on this just on a basic orientation that people have towards well, technology. Well, one of the reasons I'm pushing on this socialization versus genetics thing, and I think it's really important, is because if we say that men and women are just different and men are more likely to spread misinformation from the day that they're born, then we throw up our hands. It is what it is. But if we say that we are socializing men in this country to react to threat in a particular way, then that has really clear policy implication for how we can intervene to stop this, um, potentially at a really early age. Or if we say it's something about society, it's something about the fact that in the US today, men are unemployed at a much higher rate than women are. Um, that creates this kind of situation of threat. People are more likely to react to this. This isn't saying something about men versus women. This is saying something about the social context. And that has very different policy implications. Kelly, did you have a <laughs> what was the last part of your other individual differences that might matter was the question that's really the, the, the core of it what are the individual differences that you think influence people's response to misinformation the response to corrective information well it might be a person I was thinking it'd be interesting to do a study on this but there could be some personality factors that could uh, be in play there's a uh, very prominent theory uh, called the Big Five theory, personality factors, uh, which one of them is called openness. And uh, so people who are very high in this particular area are more open to new ideas, but they're also more willing to accept complexity. Uh, so you kind of think about uh, the current uh, environment where you've got all kinds of messages, the volume of messages, the velocity of messages, the variety of messages coming in, that somebody with an orientation that's more accepting of complexity uh, might approach uh, that situation very differently versus somebody who's low in openness. They can be more preservers. They tend to be more focused on making sense of their world based on their own past experiences. So uh, I don't know of any research yet done on it, but it does sound a little similar to some of the dialogue that we're talking about here. So I think that would be kind of an interesting uh, uh, to take a look at that and to see if that doesn't have some sort of play in, in this whole area. Well, I'll make a plug here for a great recent book by uh, Vin Arsenault and Ryan Vanderweelen about um, how need for affect and need for cognition affect your responsiveness to new political information. And what they argue is that need for cognition, so your, your desire to have kind of more interesting information, obviously if you're high in that, you'll be more responsive to kind of potentially uh, corrections or things that run counter to your pre-existing beliefs. But this is also moderated by your need for affect, so how much you just want to feel things, sort of, um, and especially feel your partisan identity. And so if people are low in that kind of partisan feeling, it's not that they're necessarily weak partisans, it's that they don't get an emotional charge out of being a partisan. Um, so to some extent, it's how emotionally are you connected to that identity and how emotionally are you connected to your identities in general. If you're lower in that and high in need for cognition, then you'll be more responsive to this type of corrective information. So I think that's a really good example of kind of bringing some insights from social psychology into the political realm and kind of thinking through how those might work. But I think there's a lot of room for more research in that area um, and kind of generalizing from what we know about uh, health communication environment from, you know, what you, I'm fascinated by what you guys are saying about um, sort of even individual kind of psychology, how people react to threat and looking at how that might generalize the political environment. I think that's a really interesting new area of research. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, oh, yeah. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Bill Martin. I'm the dean of the College of Public Health. Um, there is no more important topic for us than what we're discussing today. I want to thank John Hughes and Brian Weaver for 
creating this uh, opportunity. Uh, I, I haven't been here for everything, but I have not, I mean, I understand tribalism, I understand partisanship, I understand the impact of the internet and access to information for everyone. But I haven't heard the word trust. And I, one of our challenges in public health is we have to communicate communities and change behavior to improve health. All of that is predicated on the assumption that what we are saying is the truth. And universities are not well prepared to talk to communities for the most part. And what I have seen over the course of my life is in the 60s, new <coughs> Seth Huntley and David Brinkley or Walter Cronkett was accepted as is, and, and really the Vietnam War and the truth that came across TV about the Vietnam War was sort of an eye-opening experience for the American public. Where we are today, though, is nothing is being believed. So how do we get to the communities that are underserved, who are 90% something? That is not coincidence. That is, in part, distrust of everyone in this room, this forum, you know, what they see uh, uh, in the newspaper. How do we start? working backwards and looking at solutions that build trust. Because to me, the element, the key element is when we communicate that you believe and trust the information that's being provided. And if, if we don't get there, all of this is an interesting academic process, but I don't think it's going to rebuild what, what we need to have happen today and on the scale of our country. I just throw that as a small question. Yeah, I think this is a really important question. Um, and the, what I would suggest is starting, in, I, there's a lot of focus on what people don't trust in the institutions that they lack trust in, you know, and, but maybe we should start instead by focusing on the institutions that people do trust um, and figuring out how to shore those up and make them more effective communicators of information. I think especially in the health realm, which I see is in some ways much more important than the political realm. Um, so local news, for instance, people still really trust their local news. They trust their local TV news. Um, and that's under threat to some extent. By, we see increasing um, you know, conservative ownership of local TV stations. Uh, people with a very specific political interest are uh, more and more telling local TV news stations what to say, which I see as more problematic than conservatives distrusting the New York Times. Um, so, Local TV, you know, some government institutions people still have a lot of trust in. Uh, so thinking about that, thinking about physicians, so doctors, for example, even university professors. Um, yes, there are less trust in university professors than there used to be, but people trust us a lot more than they trust Congress, for instance. You know, no one likes Congress. Um, so we're doing better than some institutions. And I think that rather than throwing up your hands and saying, well, nobody trusts anything, look for the, look for the bright spots and build on those. Um, I guess I can comment um, at the, um, uh, for children, um, you know, being able to trust authority figures, which they typically do, um, and uh, are so impressionable with uh, um, authority figures' opinions about um, worldviews, um, and probably this goes into more community psychology where, um, you know, at the school level, uh, uh, professionals are uh, working with children, including, um, and teachers are involved in just helping to shape children and understanding of, you know, facts from fiction. Um, and at a young age, just starting out kind of with the rudimentary kind of uh, beginnings of that and, uh, and then building on that as part of a school program um, and even uh, continuing uh, like even at the college level, I think here at Ohio State University, they actually have a whole uh, um, social media literacy uh, introdu introduction for college students to uh, be able to determine um, what news sources are factual and which ones are fiction and how to make sense of, of all of that. Um, so I think it really has to begin in terms of trust and authority figures. You know, that happens early in life. And that's when these uh, belief systems begin to take shape and form. And so it, it, it's got to start, uh, you know, in, in childhood in terms of 
um, you know, trusting these authority figures, but then these authority figures, you know, helping children to kind of to program them to be more skeptical thinkers or to be more critical thinkers. Yeah, I also think trust is a concept that we have done a terrible job of figuring out how to measure it and what it actually means. Um, so, you know, people will say, I don't trust the media, but you ask them if they trust the media source that they read, and they say, yeah, I think that that's great, I trust it a lot. So what is the lack of trust in the media actually telling us about how people move about the world? That's one question. Another question is, why do we care about trust? What, what, does, what does an increased trust actually give us? And the research on that actually isn't very clear either. Um, even kind of from a big picture perspective, like what happens to a country when levels of political trust increase or decrease, there's even competing results on that. Sometimes um, decreased trust results in people working to change the system. Sometimes it results in disengagement. And we're not really sure as a discipline what the conditions are that lead to one or the other. So even when it comes to media, you can imagine that people not trusting the media could be a good thing. They're gonna go out, they're gonna seek new information, maybe they're gonna start newspapers themselves. You can also imagine it being a bad thing. They, they disengage, that they, um, they don't believe anything anyone says. And I, I, I think a lot more research is needed to figure out um, the kind of the nuances of those operationalizations and effects of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, uh, yes. So, um, Emily, you, you talked a bit, I think all of you, about how new information should allow you to update your beliefs. Are, are you seeing in the post-truth world, post-truth being the word of the year in 2016, is there any research that actually is showing, and this probably wouldn't apply to children, it applies more to adults, that this confused information environment in which they find themselves actually is indicating to a fall off in new information, allowing people to update their relief, beliefs. So you may be shown facts, right? But you're not going to update even based on those facts if that's falling off. And I just remind that the definition of post-truth in Oxford Dictionary is relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and, per and personal belief. And the other quote I wanted to be in the immortal words of Steve Bannon, um, mm -hmm. who talked about uh, uh, this, uh, said the Democrats don't matter, the real opposition is the media, and the way to deal with the media is to flood the zone with shit. So that's a sort of different way of saying it. Are, are you seeing any research that's showing this yes, generally there having is a paper effect? that actually was just published in, I think, Journal of Information Communication and Society, where they um, exposed the treatment group to a bunch of tweets about fake news. Um, not fake news itself, just people talking about fake news, and then asked them to judge how true a bunch of news articles were. And basically, after you hear the word fake news a lot, you are just more skeptical of everything. So I think that you're right that when people are operating in this environment of uncertainty, then it makes them discount any additional fact that they learn. Although, I will caveat again, is this a good thing or a bad thing, right? Because it was, on the one hand, we're saying, oh, we want to increase trust in media. On the other hand, we're saying, well, we want people to be more skeptical, right? So, so I, I think the jury is out on whether this increased skepticism is a positive or negative development. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I, I need a hand. I'm kind of short. Um, I, I had uh, I, I found uh, two like two pieces of premises that were I found contradictory, and I like to use them in my lab of comprehension. I kind of made my note. I had class. Um, <laughs> that, that's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> that makes one of us. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, we had a great class. But uh, the two things I found that, um, like, we, we talked about how uh, people don't identify in the partisan ways. You know, that we found that that was second to last, you said, that people identified partisan ways. However, I find that that was contradicted when uh, it was pointed out that um, people feel so threatened that they have to go into denial. You know, that their identity is... Uh, like so threatened that they go into grievance, uh, a grieving state, you know, denial. Um, and so if their political identity did not matter so much, why would they go into, uh, you know, a death uh, 
state of that identity. Um, so are people really not like identifying partisanly, or is it that fake news has per has permeated so much that we don't even know if we are moderate or not, you know, consciously? What I was saying is that people, you know, you're walking around and a couple of identities are going to be most salient for you when you're interacting with the world, right? Um, for women, probably your gender identity is important. For men, you get to be the default, so it probably doesn't matter quite as much, right? Um, if you are white, you probably don't much think much about your race. If you're not white, you think about that a lot. For a lot of us in this room especially, when we're walking around interacting with the world, our partisan identity is coloring how we're interacting with all new information. For most people, it's not the first thing that comes to mind. That's not to say there's still a, a, a very loud vocal subgroup who is making most of the political news and consuming most of the political news for whom it does matter. And those are also the people who are reading the fake news and who are probably being exposed to the corrections too. So that's why those th two things are true. Um, I'm talking about most people, not all people, and the subset of people for whom their partisan identity is really important are the ones who are consuming most of the fake news, reacting to it defensively, et cetera. Um, uh, yes, sir. Um, so, Emily, you made this great point that um, misinformation researchers uh, sometimes often make assumptions about the mass public that might not necessarily be true. So, for instance, they impose this definition of fake news that um, uh, doesn't map on to, let's say, how Democrats or Republicans think about fake news that they overestimate um, the level of political attention that regular people uh, kind of direct. Um, so I was wondering, um, uh, from you or the rest of the, the, the panelists, um, what assumption um, do you think that is most problematic that misinformation researchers often make that could potentially lead them to make misleading inferences um, about how the mass public Response to to misinformation. Uh, I think it's the, how much people are actually exposed to political news. Period. Um, I think that in general, political scientists way overestimate. Even if we know um, intellectually that most people just aren't reading political news that much, uh, we spend a lot of time and we're very invested in the idea that people are not only reading political news but like parsing the individual sentences in the article, and that's how we design our experiments. Right. Well, like put two different New York Times articles in front of people and one has a very slightly different wording and we'll say, oh my God, we found this effect. Whereas how much does this translate to the real world when in the real world most people just aren't reading political news at all? Um, so that, that, that would be my conclusion. Is there anything about human cognition that you think um, a lot of individuals um, kind of have a false or a, a potentially mistaken view or assumption? is of relevance to how people respond to misinformation? Well, I think that we know uh, pretty certain that, um, you know, when you look at emotions that people experience when they're exposed to news, um, that uh, people who have uh, anxiety, you know, causes them to be increasingly anxious, are people who are going to typically, um, you know, uh, have issues with, uh, trying to um, accept anything else. So, uh, you know, their field of becomes narrow in terms of what they're going to let in cognitively. And, and so when they are exposed to fake news, you know, it's, uh, and somebody tries to counter that, like another news outlet, you know, they're reading something that's contradictory and contradicting what they've uh, come to believe. Uh, they're not going to change their... Uh, cognition, they're not going to change their view, they're, they're less likely to, versus some of the research on uh, emotions that have to do with anger, like I know in adolescents, um, older adolescents who typically feel uh, more anger about and more, you know, uh, about what's they're reading in the news are more driven to uh, look at a more variety of news options. So. Um, you know, rather, they're less anxious, so they, they uh, so I think, you know, more research has to look at these uh, anxiety versus other kinds of emotions that people experience when they're exposed to all these news sources and trying to make sense out of them. 
uh, to better determine um, how to, ha you know, how to assist people, uh, or even in the research, um, uh, you know. Uh, Mark, did you, you were going to say something? I was just going to say researchers have biases too, and, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the areas we looked at was deception. Deception is obviously related to faking as well, and. Uh, it was interesting, a number of articles done on researchers who are deceptive. Uh, for example, there was a study done on honesty amongst researchers, and they varied the probability factors of results, and they found that if researchers, uh, if the probability of a result was 0 .053, what, which would mean non-significant, would you, ex would you, change your probability factor to make it significant. And they found a relatively large percentage, I think about 30% of researchers said that they would report it as 0 0.05. And then they said, well, what if the probability factor, I forgot what, it was much higher, like 0 0.6, would you report that to say that your, your results are significant? They said, no, that's dishonest. So, uh, but actually, you know, for, all the researchers or students out here, 0 0.053 means it's not significant according to, to most um, uh, accepted criteria. So, you know, there's this issue of deception even among researchers, and I thought it was interesting the journal of Higher, uh, Chronicle of Higher Education just published this on these uh, researchers who faked uh, research articles. They faked 20 research articles and then they submitted them to journals um, that had to do with gender differences and seven journals actually published these fake research articles and then they exposed it and said, you know, these, these things are fake, how could you, you know, publish these things? And I was kind of excited as a academician thinking, wow, fake news for academic Academics as well, <laughs> you know. Uh, so yeah, we we had the same is issues, you know. Uh, researchers as well. In fact, even in trying to, uh, when I wrote my, we wrote this paper. Uh, I remembered my uh, dissertation advisor saying, you know what, you always need to go back to the primary source. Never cite a secondary source. So I actually had to go back because some of the sources that we were citing, you know, these are publications in the 1930s and 40s, and I had our library going like, like crazy trying <laughs> to find these publications from the 1930s, but we were able to actually get all of them so I could actually look at the primary source and everything, because I thought, gosh, you know, if you're dealing with an issue about uh, fake information or falsification of information, you don't want to have a paper that somehow you're repeating something that's not true. So I was a little concerned because I did cite Lee and Balski in my paper, and then I found out that maybe backfire effect that it's not true. So, but at least I did know the original source. So. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions um, out there? Okay. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, So, 
I, I mean, it's really hard to do elite research, right? You guys, they, they, don't, they don't answer my surveys. I keep emailing them. But, uh, um, but it, it is the, we know, for instance, that uh, representatives tend to have really incorrect views of the ideological distribution of their um, districts. So in general, um, members of Congress think that their districts are much further right than they actually are. And one of the proposed reasons for this is because of there are just is more are more kind of louder right wing media outlets, right? And so if you watch a lot of Fox News, you get an incorrect sense of the distribution of public opinion, um, and that's again has to do with how we process information and make generalizations about information, make generalizations about sort of exemplars, right? Um, so I, I can imagine that there might be a there might be an effect there. Um, I have the microphone. Um, sorry. Um, this is uh, primarily for Professor Thorson. Um, so it's kind of interesting uh, the de how we define uh, misinformation. Um, a lot of times it's kind of, it's true or it's sort of unequivocally false. And you kind of see this borne out in the design of studies uh, where you have something that's true and something that's demonstrably false. And even the, the paper that you referenced um, from Andy Guess and Brandon Nyan, um, looking at fake news websites, I think they only coded a website as fake news if it, if it was like uh, sort of entirely false. Everything the website was distributing was completely falsified. Uh, but I think the reality is that, is that uh, misinformation in the real information environment doesn't always map onto this binary. Like, mm -hmm. even if you look at fact-checking outlets like Snopes and the Washington Post, um, you know, Washington Post has their Pinocchio meter and things get one out of five Pinocchio. So there's kind of like a varying level uh, of truth to claims and not necessarily they're, they're true or false. They might have true premises with false conclusions. So I guess my question is, uh, might there be some, some reasons, some psychological reasons to expect that along that continuum those claims might have different effects on people, they might be easier or harder to correct? Um, do you think that's an, uh, a worthwhile definitional distinction? I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, what's your name again? Uh, Ryan. Yeah, no, Ryan, you are absolutely correct. And one of the reasons, you know, as experimentalists, we tend to, we're like, all right, the treatment is true, the control is false, or whatever else, and because that makes it easier for us to analyze our experiments, but in the real world, it's just not that simple. You have things, um, there's a great uh, line that Ethan Porter uses in one of his articles called elusive misinformation, A-L-L. -L. It's politicians who are alluding to misinformation without explicitly saying it, sort of. They're making implications, and this can be just as powerful as explicit misinformation, but it never makes our way, its way into our experiments because it's just too hard to study. Um, one of the ways that I've tried to start getting around this is by also um, just as we know that information can kind of vary along a spectrum from true to false, let people's beliefs vary along a spectrum from true to false. So instead of saying, is this true or is this false, asking people, how confident are you that this is true? Because we assume that when people are more confident that a fact is true, they're more likely to use it to inform their beliefs, they're more likely to spread it to others, et cetera. So I think that that's one way that you can kind of start to get around this is, by allowing for variations in the confidence in which people hold their factual beliefs. But, I, but Ryan, that's a really fair criticism of a lot of this research, I think, including my own. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Hi, great comments. Um, I'm quite enjoying this panel myself. So I have a question about um, how people aren't in, uh, they're not in encountering fake news as often as we think, but when we ask people what are their beliefs, they'll still provide um, a choice, even if given a don't know option. I mean, sure, we can you know, include a don't know option and have that in this discussion as well. But what is going on then in the mind when people report that they believe something, but if they're not actually encountering that information, is it just sort of like Zoller's critique of this is an in the moment thing that people, uh, in the moment belief that people will share because you've asked them about it. Or do, do those sort of in the moment beliefs actually translate into these harmful democratic outcomes such as incorrect voting, for example? I think the first. I think it's totally the Zoller top of the head considerations. They're sampling from the things that are most available to them, relying on heuristics to answer those questions. But that is an empirical question. 